Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the IIEA in Dublin. It's a great pleasure to welcome those of you who are here in person at our headquarters, and indeed those of you who are currently joining online, uh, finding your seats as Zoom fires up. I have a, a very uh, enjoyable and short duty today. I'm welcoming you to our event on the role of the EU in promoting better cancer care and outcomes, which is the last of our series of three, this current work that we've done at Janssen Sciences Ireland. I just want to express my sincere gratitude to Janssen, to our, our colleagues, Mark Hanavan and, and Fergus and others who we work closely with in pulling these events together. It's been a real, a real pleasure. And I know today will be no exception. I have uh, the great pleasure of handing over to um, we don't really do national treasures in Ireland so much, but if we did, Eileen Dunn would certainly be one re requiring almost no introduction. Sorry, Eileen. Eileen retired from RTE, but many other things as well. It's a real pleasure. Eileen is going to be in the chair today, so I'm going to hand you the mic. Thanks, Barry, and good afternoon, everyone, whether you're here with us in person or online. To welcome our speakers as well, I'll introduce them all to you presently. But to say that um, I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's IIEA event, the third, as Barry says, and the final instalment in the Ireland and the I EU Health Union series. Previous sessions looked at opportunities to improve Irish health care and the role that the EU could play in improving care for patients with rare diseases here and in the EU. But today, as Barry says, we're going to focus on the role of the EU in promoting better cancer care and outcomes across the union through various initiatives contained within the EU's Beating Cancer Plan because as part of that health union, the EU has prioritised cancer care. We'll also be looking at how Ireland has fared within that plan. Just some housekeeping. Each of our speakers today will speak to us for about seven to ten minutes. Uh, we'll then go to a Q&A with our audience. We'd like you, you can get your questions into us online if you wish, or you can ask, of course, in person here. And as you're asking a question, we'd ask you each to identify yourselves. Um, a reminder, they, both the presentations and the Q&A session will be on the record. And also, please free to join. feel free to join the discussion on X. You can post on X. I don't think he has quite come up with a verb for, to replace tweet yet, but you can post on X using the handle at IIEA. So our panel today includes Averill Power, who's CEO of the Irish Cancer Society. Professor Ray McDermott is next, consultant medical oncologist. Senator Annie Hoey from Drada. Barry Andrews has joined us, a member of the European Parliament, and Dr. Thorsen Giesica, who's general manager, commercial business, Janssen Sciences in Ireland. And we're very happy to have you all here with us today. Averill is going to speak first. She's been Chief Executive of the Irish Cancer Society since January 2018. She has over 15 years leadership, policy making, and campaign experience, having served as CEO of the Asthma Society, as an elected member of Shanna Aaron, and a policy advisor in several government departments. She holds a degree in business, including non-profit management from Trinity, and was president of Trinity Students Union in 2001 and two. She also has a diploma in law from the King's Inns. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Averill Power. Thanks very much, Eileen. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity today on behalf of the Irish Cancer Society to outline how a future where no one dies of cancer is within our reach and what needs to happen both at a national level and a European level to deliver that. Every three minutes, someone in Ireland hears the words, you've got cancer. I know that many of you have probably heard those words personally or been given that news about someone you love, your spouse, your parent, your close friend, or even your child. As a result, you'll know all too well the impact the cancer has, the fear and uncertainty that it brings, the physical, emotional, and financial burden it imposes, the enormous grief when it takes the life of a loved one too soon, and the impact on those who are fortunate to survive the disease but struggle with lasting effects like infertility, incontinence and fatigue. There 
isn't a family in Ireland that hasn't already been affected by cancer and with one in two of us now expected to get the disease within our lifetime, that means that half of the people in this room and on joining us online today will get a cancer diagnosis personally at some time in the future if you haven't already. When you do, um, you deserve the best possible chance both of surviving the disease and of having a good quality of life afterwards. And I think the, the good news um, is that cancer survival has increased significantly in Ireland in recent decades. You know, 35 years ago, only three out of 10 Irish people survived a cancer diagnosis. Today, six in 10 do. Um, and nine out of 10 people now survive breast, prost prostate and testicular cancer. Um, which is incredible progress in a relatively short space of time. Um, and indeed, the pace of scientific and medical progress that we have now is so remarkable that I genuinely believe, and I know Ray sees this when both his work here and I'm sure international in really inspiring presentations at international conferences, that like the improvements that we're making now are so remarkable, the potential is so huge that the Irish Cancer Society believes that a future where no one dies from cancer is within our grasp. If we give it, if we give cancer the political priority and the investment that it needs, both in Ireland and across the globe, some cancers will be preventable, just as cervical cancer largely is now with the HPV vaccine. Um, others will be much more easily cured with better, um, more personalised and less toxic treatments than we have now. And others still will be manageable chronic illnesses that will people will live with for a long time um, after diagnosis with a minimal impact on their quality of life. And our goal at the Irish Cancer Society, and I'm sure the ambition of, of everybody joining us today, is to bring that day forward um, so that as soon as possible, bring forward the day when nobody in Ireland has their life tragically cut short by cancer. And when everybody who survives the disease has the access to the support that they need to live life to the full. And we're getting there, um, but we're not getting there fast enough. Uh, while nine out of 10 Irish people now survive breast, prostate and testicular cancer, only two in 10 survive lung, pancreatic or brain cancer. People from lower socioeconomic groups are still far more likely um, both to get and to die from cancer in Ireland than those for on higher incomes. And many survivors still don't have the support that they need to be able to cope with the lasting physical, emotional and financial burden that the disease imposes. Comparative European data also shows that Ireland still has a long way to go to catch up on the best performing countries in the European Union. Earlier this year, the European Cancer Inequalities Registry published a cancer country profile for Ireland, which is rich in data. I see Annie has it in front of her here as well, which is rich in data, both on how we're getting on in Ireland and how we compare across overall survival in specific cancers across a wide range of different cancer outcomes with other European countries. And that showed that in 2019, which is the latest comparative data that they had for the report, Ireland's cancer mortality rate was the third highest of all of the Western European countries um, included in that survey. Um, and that our mortality rate was also considerably higher than that of leading countries like Finland, Sweden, and Spain. Um, across all 29 EEA countries included, we were uh, slightly higher than average in terms of overall cancer mortality but that is not where any of us want to be. That's not where you want to be when you hear those words. If you hear those words, you've got cancer. It's not where you want to be if your loved one is given that news. Average is not where we aspire to be and not where we can where we can be. Um, so even before COVID-19, that's 2019 data, Ireland was already lagging behind our peers in terms of cancer survival. We're also behind today in a number of other key areas like e-health, access to new medicines, access to world-class ways of delivering cancer care through comprehensive cancer centres, which are common in the rest of, of Western Europe in particular, and support for cancer survivors. We also face major challenges, as you know, 
in attracting and retaining healthcare professionals in the Irish healthcare system and oncology system and the Irish research environment. So we have a lot of work to do, um, unfortunately. Firstly, to deliver cancer outcomes that are on a par um, with the best performing countries and where they are right now. And to ensure that all Irish cancer patients, regardless of their background, their socioeconomic status, get early access to the benefits of the breakthroughs that are coming through all the time and that we will increasingly see into the future. This will only happen um, with serious commitment from the Irish government to properly prioritizing and properly resourcing the full delivery of our national cancer strategy. The Irish Cancer Society is deeply disappointed um, that that has not been the case in recent years. The current strategy was published in 2017 and has only received dedicated funding in two of the seven national budgets introduced since then. So as a result, the National Cancer Programme has not been able to deliver many of the key improvements in cancer prevention, detection, treatment and survivorship set out in the strategy. And despite decades of you know, significant improvements, as I mentioned prior to that in the period up to 2018, 2019 in cancer survival, we've stalled, progress has been really slow in recent years due to that lack of investment. The Irish Cancer Society hopes in, in turning to the be Europe's Beating Cancer Plan, the Irish Cancer Society hopes that the EU's Beating Cancer Plan will help to accelerate the pace of improvement in Ireland, both by putting pressure on our national government to make the most of what we already know about cancer um, and how to deliver world-class cancer outcomes to learn from the better performing countries in Europe, and also by improving our knowledge through the 4 billion euro investment under the plan in cancer research and service innovation. The plan is already showing some promise um, for Irish people affected by cancer in Ireland. Irish researchers are already working in collaboration with EU counterparts on large EU funded research projects, pooling expertise to deliver faster and bigger breakthroughs um, than they could alone. Irish clinicians have funded, have received part funding from the EU to pilot screening programs here for lung and gastric cancers. And the requirements under the plan that each member state set up an EU cancer mission hub is also helping efforts to secure greater collaboration and cooperation between key players in Ireland, such as government bodies, hospitals, academic institutions, NGOs, pharma, and other industry partners. The Irish Cancer Society hopes that the priority given to cancer data and e-health in the EU beating cancer plan will also result in national level improvements. Timely access to data intelligence is essential to better understand what's happening in cancer services today and why. It's crucial for smart decision making and proper allocation of limited resources. And it's essential for holding government to account on progress in the national cancer strategy. Cancer patients' data access to their own data, um, as has been done in other countries like Estonia and Sweden, can also help them better manage their health, their own health. Um, despite progress, some progress is made in Ireland in developing a national cancer information system, Ireland is far behind where we need to be and far behind, frankly, where some countries were 10, 15 years ago in terms of access to data and digital health. The EU Beating Cancer Plan has prioritised this area and improving access to cancer data um, to flagship initiatives like the European Cancer Information System and the European Cancer Inequalities Registry. And again, hopefully this pressure through the EU on having that data to be able to place and compare at a European level will put pressure on our own authorities to invest in collecting and analysing data at national level. Um, we also hope that the emphasis on e-health in the Beating Cancer Plan will result in a greater national focus on unleashing the potential of digital technologies to improve full access to and quality of healthcare in Ireland. Digital technologies can have the potential to just deliver incredible innovation um, in how we access healthcare. They can help people reduce their own cancer risk through wearables and other technologies. Improve, they can improve cancer screening and detection, enhance clinical decision-making and improve access to care in the community through initiatives such as remote monitoring. 
and they can also help us overcome and really acute uh, workplace shortages that we're already experiencing now and increasingly see into the future a shortage of healthcare professionals. The Irish government must invest in and prioritise e-health urgently to ensure that we can benefit here in Ireland from the potential of advances happening in this area at the EU level. The European Bleeding Cancer Plan also highlights the essential role of comprehensive cancer centres as drivers of improvements in cancer outcomes. And this, again, will hopefully put pressure on our government to deliver the commitment in the 2017 National Cancer Strategy to uh, establish at least one such centre in Ireland. So to conclude, um, as I said at the start, one in two of us will get cancer in our lifetime. When we do, we deserve the best possible chance, both of surviving the disease and having a good quality of life afterwards. And while Ireland's cancer outcomes improved considerably in the period up to 2018, 2019, progress has slowed, unfortunately, since then due to a lack of investment in recent years. And the Irish Cancer Society hopes that the EU Beating Cancer Plan can help change that through investment and collaboration at a European level, and also by putting pressure on national governments to deliver. Um, a future where no one dies from cancer is within our reach, um, but it will take both national commitment and the might of the EU and other international institutions to deliver it. Thank you. Avril Power, thank you. Our next guest is Professor Ray McDermott. He commenced his training in medical oncology at the Matter Hospital in Dublin. He then went on to the Institute Curie in Paris, where he completed a PhD in tumor immunology. And having completed his clinical training at the Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia, he returned to Ireland in 2004 and took up a post as consultant medical oncologist at the Adelaide Meath and National Children's Hospital in Tala. Under the auspices of the National Cancer Control Programme and the establishment of the Centres of Excellence, Dr. McDermott's public hospital commitment was split between Tala and St. Vincent's University Hospital, where he pursues his interest in genitourinary and gastrointestinal cancers. He's the National Cancer Control Programme leader in guideline development for prostate cancer, and he sits on the new drug evaluation committee across all diseases. He's also also formalized many international collaborations on cancer over the years, so is well placed to speak to what we're speaking about today. Professor Ray McDermott. And thanks, Eileen, and thanks for asking me to speak today. I was interested in Avril's, uh, you know, her introduction about having a future without cancer. For me, with the boots on the ground, that seems a long way away, although, uh, you know, obviously I share her view in, in wishing that was the case. But uh, when I go into the hospital and I do my ward rounds, it does seem like it's a far way away at the moment. Still, I have a great interest in making sure that Ireland is up at the top of where we need to be in terms of cancer treatment, uh, prevention and uh, diagnosis. Uh, as Avril said, I don't want to repeat. Um, look, the uh, cancer is becoming more common as our population ages. It's estimated that the number of patients with cancer diagnosis will double between now and 2045. That's unless Avril's uh, plan kicks in, of course, <laughs> which we all hope it will. <laughs> but in the meantime, we have to plan for having an aging population. The overall rate of cancer is not increasing. It's just that our population is getting older. And clearly that's going to have implications for what is already a very stretched healthcare service. Um, Thinking about, you know, people say they tried, is there any cure for cancer? You know, cancer is a series of different diseases. It's not one disease. It's a complex uh, series of diseases. And as Avril mentioned, in some diseases, we're doing very well. In prostate cancer, you know, 90% of people who are diagnosed with it are cured. Breast cancer, something similar. Lung cancer lags behind um, and colon cancer is somewhere in the middle. Overall, though, I think about two thirds of people who are diagnosed with cancer can expect to be cured, which is, you know, still very good. Not where we would want to be, but still better than it used to be. Um, the one, one thing that will lead to is an increased uh, number of survivors in the population with sequelae of their cancer, whether that be, as Avril mentioned, infertility, incontinence, you know, different issues related to the treatment that I give them potentially. 
like peripheral neuropathy, different things that happen to patients along their cancer journey. And certainly we have to make uh, allowances for that whenever we're planning for cancer in the future as well. Look, things, some things have improved. I don't want to be negative. Definitely the end, advent of the NCCP, we're on our third cancer strategy. You know, the NCCP has led to centralization of many surgeries. So for example, I work in St. Vincent's now. There are two centers in Ireland that operate where operations for pancreas cancer take place. Previously, that would have been, you know, eight to 10. There are a number of cancer centers where breast cancer can be operated on, similarly rectal cancer. So that all that esophageal cancer, that's all very positive. When it comes to uh, radiation treatment, there has been a rollout. There was a new center open in Galway there a couple of weeks ago that completes the, the network that was envisaged in Donald Hollywood's plan. Unfortunately, as always with these things, it's never big enough to cope with the demand that's there. And one thing that's really good in cancer that we always see is things are always changing. So you, you plan for X amount of treatments in Y diseases and as, as cancer treatment changes, and as we go to our meetings, at, at, as Thoris and I were at ESMO last week in Madrid, you come back from that and suddenly the paradigm has changed. You're now no longer saying, oh, this is what we're doing. Now it's, we have to do that. So it's, it's a very dynamic process. And, and that is part of the difficulty, I suppose, in, in the planning process. When it comes to surgery, I, I've mentioned that, uh, that a lot of that's been centralized. What I do, uh, chemotherapy, and increasingly now uh, things like immunotherapy and newer drugs like that. And um, that has all been very much standardized by through the NCCP so that if you're getting your care in Dublin, in Donegal, in Sligo, the same standards in terms of administration and, and the protocols that use should be the same. So no patient should lose out by having by getting their treatment closed home, which is of course what we want. So there definitely have been improvements. There have been more consult when I came back to Ireland, there was probably you know, 15 medical oncologists in the country, now there are 70. So that's that's a big improvement. And, and some things like that we have to hail. Um, unfortunately, I, I, it's, it's, it's always, as I said, a dynamic process. And one of the things that I, as a medical oncologist, love to see is when I go to these meetings in Madrid, they present what's the latest. So we know Vicky Phelan fought hard to get immunotherapy for her cervical cancer. The reality is immunotherapy works in about 10% of patients with cervical cancer. There are, but there are better treatments out there and there are better treatments coming. So the latest types of treatment are you combine a, 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 a drug that will take the, a, a, an antibody, which will take the drug to where you want it to be rather than just giving chemotherapy into the vein and blitzing everything, your hair falls out, you know, your skin turns a different color. Now what happens is you, you, you attach the chemotherapy or the tar to an antibody, which directly goes to where the cancer is and specifically targets that area. So, a, so we're getting better and better at targeting where the cancer is and hopefully minimizing some of those other effects that we didn't want to see and that, that, and that patients always had to suffer. Of course, that comes with a cost though these new developments um, they are they cost money and the, the development costs, but also when it comes to being making them available for our patients, um, that is one area that that um, is a problem because Ireland unfortunately has is now lagging behind in terms of our approval for new drugs. And as, a, as someone who treats patients, meets patients every day, and these days patients know what's out there. They don't, it's not like when I started off. Uh, do medical oncology, then I'd be telling patients what is out there. They're now coming in, they've done their research and they know what's out there. And then I'm saying to them, look, well, I'm sorry, you live in Ireland, we can't do this. Unfortunately, it's not available. So obviously that's a great source of frustration for me. The way that the, the drug approvals process is the EMEA, so gives an approval for a, a certain drug. And then from then on, it comes down to the country to negotiate the price. No, look, I'm not. I was on that uh, drug approvals committee. I'm no longer on it, but uh, and I understand the, that there is a certain amount. There's a limit in the amount that we can pay for these drugs, and I'm not suggesting that we break the budget. But when we hear that there's no additional budget for next year for new drugs, um, that to me is a real heart sink moment because how are we going to offer our patients these access to these treatments? Um, if we can't um, uh, pay for any new drugs. 
And the and one thing I'm sure you, some of you may have seen that we had we had a row in the newspaper. We had to go public with it earlier on this year, whereby um, now all the insurers will agree if you have health insurer that they will cover these drugs once they are they're approved by the MEA. So that's great. But it's only for a certain part of the population. That wasn't the point of what we were doing there. That patient that I went to the papers with was about trying to get her. When I'm sitting in front of a patient, I want them to get access to the best treatment for, 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 for them. So that was about her, and thankfully that worked. But for all the other patients who don't have health insurance, we need equity. I don't want, no oncologist wants a two-tier system whereby, as Mary Harney would say, you turn right if you have health insurance and you turn left if you don't, and you get different treatment. Nobody wants that. We certainly don't want that. We want the same access for all of our patients. And I know Thorsten is going to talk about some of the mechanisms, potentially how Ireland could afford this. But I know that when it comes to access, we're down the bottom. We're just with Portugal and the Western European countries in terms of our access. Um, uh, and I know that countries like Denmark that are similar size to us do better. And potentially with this new EU, EU mission on cancer, is that is that a way that we could potentially look at different models for funding our cancer drugs? I would hope so. Look, um, these things are not cheap. And I know I was reading, the I, I looked up the New York Times yesterday, there's now a cure for sickle cell disease. Uh, but the, the cost of it is, uh, it's with this CRISPR gene technique would cost over a million uh, dollars for the for one treatment. So obviously that's a big figure. If you think about the cost of an, a, a hospitalization with sickle cell crisis, it wouldn't be long getting up to a million. But I, I, So you have to balance those things out. Again, it's not an easy equation, not one that I can uh, necessarily contribute to, but one that I know is a source of great frustration for our patients. Potentially, uh, one way of getting around some of the cost is by clinical trials. I'm the clinical lead of Cancer Trials Ireland. And uh, we try uh, in the cancer strategy, the third one that Avril mentioned, the, the, the target for cancer patients on trials was 6%. We're about 2%. If we want to get up to 6%, we need more investment in clinical trials. You get access to drugs on clinical trials. Generally, those drugs are provided for free. And actually, we save uh, the exchequer money by putting paper people onto clinical trials. So that is certainly one way that we should um, uh, prioritize, I would have thought, for the future. So look, I think um, my I think I've made my point. Uh, the other thing that the other last point I will make is that if you look at government strategies like the UK government, we all know that what got us out of COVID was Pfizer vaccine and BioNTech. Um, and Moderna with, with uh, Pfizer. Basically, the UK government has now, those vaccines are coming into cancer treatment. And the UK government has made an agreement with both BioNTech and Moderna to, to enroll clinical trials uh, throughout the UK over the next number of years. Why can't Ireland do something like that? Why can't we go to these companies and say, look, we're going to, can we copy the UK model? Can we have a set target? For the number of patients we will put on these vaccine trials over the we 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 have to pay, but ultimately we will save because those vaccines are used in the adjuvant setting when someone's had surgery and we're looking to prevent the cancer from coming back. That's when vaccines will work, and that that's the kind of thing that we should be doing in my view. Thank you. Well, as, as Avril said at the beginning, one in two of us will possibly face a cancer diagnosis in our lifetime. But even if we don't, we've all been touched by cancer at some point in our lives, as indeed has our next guest, Annie Hoey, who cared for her father who had cancer in the last over the last couple of years. An active student life was what led her to her seat in the Shannon and where she works today to affect change through diversity, inclusion, equality and acceptance. From Drada, she first attained a Bachelor of Arts, a Drama and Theatre Studies before pursuing a Master of Arts and then in 2013 undertook a postgraduate course in Women's Studies. Throughout her busy student life, she progressed through key representative roles within the US body politic and as chair of the LGBT society she was voted college society person of the year for her contribution to amnesty. 
She began her public life as a councillor in Bettystown in County Meath before joining the Shannon in 2020. And from the outset, she has lobbied on issues such as abortion health care, marriage equality, transphobia, biphobia and homophobia. She's the first female parliamentarian to come out as bisexual and the second woman to come out in the Iroquois or the Houses of Parliament. Senator Annie Hoy. Thanks very much. That was a real like fun black uh short through the past there. I thought, yeah, I did all those things. That's nice. And um, so thank you so much for having me here today. So I suppose I'm here from kind of two hats. The the one which is the politic one. And I I I sit on the um oh, Joint Rocks Committee on Health um and the subcommittee on mental health. I'm also on the all party group on cancer. Um, but I also come with a very personal perspective in terms of my own father who um not long after I was elected into the Shannon, we got a, a cancer diagnosis and it was a very short illness, uh, fraught with all sorts of complications. So I won't go too much into the personal uh, patient experience, but there was, you know, it was during COVID and there was a lot of difficulties at that time. The care he got, you know, uh, was what it was, but it, there was, you know, there's a lot of people for whom th there was a diagnosis during that period who are, I think are possibly still hurting, are still reeling from the consequence of that. I'm not sure if we've even fully got to grips with some of that. Um, but it, it, it's an area that um, just when, when Ava was talking about, you know, like the e-health and the, the electronic records, if we want to have a bit of a gloomy uh, feeling, go back and watch the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Health when we discussed the e-health records and where we were at in Ireland. And I think a lot of our, our mouths were, our jaws were on the floor, actually, at some of the responses we were getting. They're like, we haven't got funding for this. We're cutting doing that. We're not even looking at the other. And we were like, what? <laughs> what? How? You know, it was it, it was grim. It was a grim session. Um, not that all sessions in Leinster House and the, the committees are grim, but it was it was difficult listening, um, both from a political perspective, because we know that this is the right thing to do in terms of moving to that e-health, that data pace piece, but also from a very personal perspective. You know, I was driving from hospitals. You know, I had to drive from one hospital to another because there was no records of my dad's care. And I had to go and effectively wrestle the records from one hospital to drive them to another hospital. And um, so we could try and follow him around with what his care was, because there wasn't a care piece. But, it, you know, there was a, just a bit of a breakdown of communication at the time. And that even from, a, 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 you know, I, I could drive, my mum couldn't drive, my sister couldn't, you know, even that piece that we had to do during that period, during COVID, uh, where people were being stopped on the roads as to why they were going. And I was like, you know, holding a, a record of someone being like, I've got to, I've got to get this to Drada. It's very important, you know, bizarre kind of situation. So when, um, so I'm really, would be really interested to see how that European piece could possibly influence our movement towards that, that e-records, that e-health. And I know there's, 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 there's potential for problems with it, but that data piece, I think is going to be so important, but also just the, 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 the ease and the peace that that could possibly give patients you know, my dad couldn't do the driving because he was in another hospital. So I went and did it. And um, that's a huge strain that people don't need at that time, uh, driving records from one place to the other. So just I'm I'm really hopeful, actually, that and this the, the kind of there's EU leadership on this that will filter down. And sometimes uh, we look to the EU to filter down to us and sometimes we uh, storm out on our own. But I think this is a real opportunity, I hope, to kind of nudge us to where we need to be with that. Um, I'm particularly interested as well when um, my own dad's cancer was lung cancer, it wasn't a vaccine preventable cancer, you know, when reading up on the documentation around this, you know, plan around these vaccine uh, preventable cancers in Europe, um, particularly obviously as, as a woman, I'm a young woman, all of us know of Vic Fianan, Laura Brennan, and um, I am surprised at how many women my age, uh, under the age of 35, who I know who have had cervical cancer in their 20s, you know, so I think there's a lot of... Um, we have a lot of family members who are, I think, see the real potential in that. Like to me, it's an, a, an incredible thing that there could be a whole generation of people, girls and boys, for whom that cancer could be eradicated. Like that's an incredible opportunity. So I'm really excited there when I see like that European push. Um, but then obviously when you see the differential between where some countries are up on 90% of HPV back and then other countries are much lower. And we, we uh, I think we will also from COVID will feel the repercussions of this misinformation and the, the vaccine uh, kind of scaring. Um, and again, I, I hear 
And I've had like really interesting like rows with women my age where they're like, well, I don't think I'd get my daughter, this fictional daughter, they don't even have children yet. And I'm like, how can you, like, how can you comprehend that? They're like, oh, well, you know, I just heard this, that and the other. Like, and, and, and that's a, a funny place. And they wouldn't have said that a couple of years ago. And I'm, you know, I, I'm, I don't know where we're at in terms of data gathering and stuff. And I think it'll possibly take a couple of years, but the impact of COVID, um, I don't know if there's any European studies on that, but the impact of that COVID misinformation around vaccines, is that going to have a knock on effect on that plan to try and and deal with vaccine preventable cancers? You know, is there going to be and I'd be very interested to see whether whether the, there's going to be EU led data on that or whether individual countries will do that themselves. Um, and then in terms of the, the, the preventable or certainly screenable cancers, and this is something that, you know, April and I've talked about and I've talked about in the health committee around the screening piece. So obviously we have screening for breast cancer, cervical cancer, colorectal cancers, bellicose, certain cancers, and an area, again, because it's very personal to me, is around lung cancer. So I know, you know, there have been trials over in the UK. Are we allowed to mention UK in an EU event? Or we can cover up this? <laughs> get him over that quickly. Um, you know, there and there have been, you know, uh, trials there in terms of those low socioeconomic areas or at risk people. I mean, it, it, it was written on paper potentially that my dad could have developed that lung cancer, you know, with, and that's no no judgment on anything. There was just that was just was his age, lifestyle, and all these other various things. And I remember he was really upset because he gave up smoking very early on, the kind of at the early stages of people giving up smoking. And, you know, and I think that really, you know, upset both him and he's like but I gave it up like I was I did what I was supposed to do and I'm very much of the opinion it was caught very very late and it was only caught because he was in for something else and I think there's a particular lung cancer and men of that age you know it's up to 20 25 percent get caught because of something else they're in an A&E over this that and the other and there's a scan you know and that's how it was found out and we would never have known otherwise and I don't think it needs to be that way and he didn't have to suffer that way and our family didn't have to suffer that way so that screening piece you know we're learning from the UK I know there's trials being brought in here in Ireland and I think that's going to be so important that uh, that sharing of that information you know that targeted screening um, and I know there's thoughts around oh screening it costs this much and is it all that valuable and all this that and the other and obviously I would turn around and say well my dad would have been a prime candidate for that screening five years beforehand a couple of years beforehand and potentially what would have happened to our family wouldn't have happened. Um, the last thing I might um, just very briefly talk about, and again, it's a little bit around that experience, is that, you know, so obviously there's this huge big funding there in the EU and investment into, into that research piece. And I'm our party spokesperson on further and higher education. So I'm really interested in that research. We had some really interesting conversations in the joint or the all party group on cancer around these centres of excellence and like how that's going to work and, and where is that funding going to come from? You know, and we we've always seen really good collaboration from an academic perspective and the academics go off and do all these cross country linking up and doing all of these things. And, and I would I assume that obviously part of that, that European piece now with that, you know, I know the enormous increase in funding at the European level, it was 20 million to four, but, you know, unfathomable increase in funding towards cancer care that 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 filters down not only into that that research piece, but also how people get their care. So in Ireland, and anyone who has ever had a, someone who has suffered from cancer, whether they, they pass on or not, you know, access to that hospice care and that piece of care. There was a point where someone had a conversation with us about moving my dad to Newry for his last couple of weeks. And, and not to get all six counties about it, but for the purpose of that conversation, I was like, that's another country. Like, we're not moving him to another country because that's the nearest place he can get care like we're not going to do that my mom doesn't drive my sister just had a baby my other sister didn't drive and um, I'd actually just had an accident there was no way we could have even gotten to him in another country for his care and like that's not where we need to be in Ireland where a doctor is sitting down with a family member to be like we don't have the facilities in this hospital and the nearest hospital to you is for all intents and purpose in another country that is not where our care needs to be in Ireland um it's not even in the EU anyway. So it was particularly egregious that that was the conversation. So, you know, the, there's there's that that research piece, but also like we're still so far, I think, behind in that facilities piece, that hospice care, that step down care, that care at home. We all know the, the, the numbers around getting home care and all of those things. Um, and I know there's been injections of funding here and there, but we're we're not where we need to be 
and you know very much people we, we rely on the cancer society to provide that care for our family members when i think that care should be coming from a state level should be coming from a government level it should be at a cross eu level but not at the cross eu level that we're sending people to other countries it should be uh, you know everyone should be able to get the care that they need in their own country and um, in their own county near to where they live um, when they need it and not be having any sort of conversations we had the social capital and the political capital to fight that and to get him the care that he needed at home not everyone has uh you know this that and the other person's number not everyone has someone who can do that and people's care should not be reliant on geography uh, who has the loudest mouth in the family and um, and you know just being able to negotiate you shouldn't have to negotiate cancer care and i would be hopeful that at some point not only on our on our journey to eradicating cancer that we also eradicate that people get care based on their negotiation skills their political skills their social capital that's not how we should be providing care so we when we talk about a two-tier health system not only do we have an insured you know private insurance and the public we have a health system where people who have the capital to be able to negotiate care compared to people who don't have the capital to be able to do that and that's another part of our our health system that i just don't think we're really getting to grips with and i'm hopeful that there's a bit of a european project around bringing everyone up to that base level of care so i'll I'll end on that somewhat not gloomy note but I'm very optimistic for on the journey of eradicating cancer we also eradicate the inequalities in terms of who actually gets the care that they need and it's as I said shouldn't be based on who has a family member who can shout the loudest that's not a, a good base of care I think hey, good afternoon everybody it's great to be here uh, it's my first time back here since um, I was director general uh, here for a very short time um, so delighted to be invited back and invited to be back to see familiar faces as well um, and to discuss an issue of, uh, of critical importance um, just on a personal scale we talk about how everyone's touched by it I was very sort of brushed barely by cancer in that I've had various uh, basal cell carcinomas whipped out over the years including the quite lurid scar there you can see which looks semi-heroic but I there's so many people are affected in this way and it's not really uh, a, you know a very serious issue for me but it's uh, it just illustrates uh, you know how it touches so many people and uh, I think there's a much greater awareness now about the dangers of uh, you know UV radiation people trying to take more much more care care that I didn't take when I was a teenager uh, and in my 20s when awareness wasn't as as, as good as it is now and the care that's taken by people. So since I became an MEP um, in 2020, I joined the um, MEPs Against Cancer group, of whom there are about 120 MEPs from across uh, the member states, including five Irish MEPs. And uh, I've been very struck by the degree to which uh, the cancer lobby has been successful in its advocacy in putting cancer at the center of European policy development, particularly in the center of European health policy. Um, so the, the, the advantage in some way of the pandemic is that it put EU health in, at a much more central position than it had been. The uh, policy area is it's covered by DG Sante, which is very much a backwater, if I may say, before the pandemic from a point of view of policy development. But it is now much, much more in the center of what the European Union has, has done. So the president of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, in her State of the Union in 2020, uh, decided that we're, we're going to push forward the idea of a European health union. And the beating cancer strategy is an element of the evolution of the European Health Union. But what we learned from the pandemic is that while health is a limited competence of the European Union, we could see how so much more was able to be done at a European level, particularly the procurement and distribution of vaccines, which was of enormous benefit to smaller member states like Ireland, but also the, uh, the role that uh, the European Medicines Ag Agency had in the uh, uh, in, in in pushing the uh, approval of the vaccine, the development of HERA, H E R A, which has uh, been really really important, and I think the digital COVID certificate, one of the most extraordinarily quick legislative procedures 
which allowed the European tourism industry to get going again. So we were able to see across, and, and of course the European Centre for Disease Control played such a critical role in monitoring and surveillance of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, pandemic. So we saw for the first time what Europe could actually do in the health area. Uh, another development that occurred uh, early in this mandate was the establishment of a special European Parliament committee on beating cancer, which is known as BECA. And it, it sat for two years and it, there were hearings from experts, uh, from, from clinicians, from patient groups, and from the pharmaceutical industry. And they produced a report which signposted a lot of what is in the beating cancer strategy. And it is exceptional for a European Parliament special committee to be set up. This very rarely happens. There are, there's one now on the question of the Pegasus inquiry into spyware. I was on one which is around foreign interference in democratic institutions known as the Inga Committee, but there was a specific special European Parliament Committee on Cancer Care, which is quite an extraordinary thing. And that reported in 2021, and I want to remember uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Veronique Trillet-Lenoir, who is a professor uh, in, uh, of cancer care and herself succumbed to cancer during the summer in 2023. So she was an MEP colleague who was co-chair of the MEPs Against Cancer and was rapporteur on the Becca Committee report, which published in, in 2021. Um, so the beating cancer strategy itself, we've heard reference to it. I think just drawing on what Averill said, I think two of the, you know, there are 10 flagship initiatives in the beating cancer strategy. People are familiar with various multiple action points around it. But I think the two areas where we really have, we can, draw value from the beating cancer strategy is one is the data issue and I, I Annie was making the point about dragging records from one area to another and it I had a flashback to my time as minister for children and in the area of child protection records of child protection are held in the same way paper records in different uh, health areas across the country and unfortunately if a vulnerable family with child protection issues moves from one area to the other. It's not always the case that the records follow them. So the absence of that uh, e-health and health data is a critical vulnerability in child protection, but also in this area. So the creation under the beating cancer plan, uh, the beating cancer strategy of a European health data space is uh, offers a lot of hope. Um, and I think that it, you know, the HSC is, well, am I optimistic? Not necessarily, but <laughs> we try to push this issue around, uh, you know, ho holding records in a correct way across the, across the HSC before TUSLA was set up. And I was told it would take five to six years um, and it never happened. Uh, I was gone after a couple of years as it happens. So the other area I think where we are already drawing value, I mean, there's no, multiple areas that Ray mentioned already, the areas that we've drawn value from, but also from the area of the register of inequality. And uh, the OECD recently under this initiative uh, drew attention to in Ireland, the fact in Ireland that if you're from uh, the, the least affluent, the socioeconomic sector in Ireland, you're 40% more likely to die of cancer than the most affluent. And that just, is the most stark figure. It's a lot to do with not accessing screening. It's a lot to do with uh, lifestyle and you know tobacco and alcohol and nutrition, but nevertheless, it's very clear that this is adding value to the debate and the discussion in Ireland. And this is coming from the beating cancer strategy. So uh, I, I, there, there are other areas I think where we can uh, benefit from, from the strategy, but the funding, uh, four billion sounds like a lot, but over a period of the multi-annual financial framework, and you compare it to annual budgets and health. So, for example, France spends two hundred billion a year. So, four billion on this over the period of the multi-annual financial framework isn't huge. But those calls for proposal under EU for Health are already uh, generating uh, activity and generating cross-border. Uh, applications for funding. And as Ray mentioned, the special cancer mission under Horizon is very positive. And the final thing I'll say about funding, um, and again, Ray kind of touched upon it, is, is uh, the European Investment Bank provided a preferential loan to BioNTech. 
100 billion 100 million euro which uh, was part in order to develop the mRNA vaccine for cancer treatment but as it happens uh, its use in the in in dealing with covid became very apparent early on so it raises a question because all of us are stakeholders in the EIB because our EIB because our member states all are uh, capitalized the bank so there is a degree to which the vaccine is a public good because we invested in it. It's not just capitalism. It is a social investment by governments through the European Investment Bank. And it raises the question about the degree to which governments can insist that licenses apply and that patents are limited in certain circumstances of emergency. And we saw this in the context of the pandemic, particularly the TRIPS agreement and the waivers that are uh, anticipated under the TRIPS agreement and whether they should be applied. So it relates back to the investment that goes into the vaccines that are going to, and I think um, mRNA, as I said, originally was supposed to be to do with uh, cancer vaccines. So it'll be fascinating to see how that, all of that develops. So uh, there's two more issues I want to mention. One, one of the big challenges we have is around access to medicines and the pandemic really surfaced the problem of uh, supply chain challenges and uh, shortages of medicines, which are very much uh, at the forefront of the EU pharmaceutical strategy. Uh, it's very contested space, the EU pharmaceutical strategy. Our colleagues from the pharmaceutical industry are beating down our door to underline how important it is that if we don't uh, provide a very positive uh, uh, environment for investment, in the European Union, it will have a cost in terms of innovation and breakthrough medicines and medicines for rare diseases, et cetera. And, uh, and, and we will pay a high price for that. On the other hand, the European Union holds the view that unless we regulate to a better extent, it becomes a lottery about where you're born in the European Union as to whether or not you're able to access certain medicines. That's the debate that's going on. And, um, you know, we, we've had, uh, there's, a, there's a period of consultation, which ends next week, I think it is. So it's very much contested. It's very much live. And it's it's going to be a challenge for us to uh, get agreement on this. Some of the member states, like Germany, is very much trying to, uh, you know, is on the side of the pharmaceutical industry. Other member states have different points of view, particularly Eastern European member states. So, um it, I, I won't go into the supply chain issue. They're not uh, germane very much to to cancer, except to, you know they apply to all all, all the, these issues. But I want to say, but by way of conclusion, that we are coming to the end of this mandate. And I said at the beginning that I was really impressed with the advocacy, the success of the Irish Cancer Society and all the networks of cancer societies across Europe in putting cancer so centrally in the middle of health policy and then the uplift of the pandemic and interest in the year. So it's a very propitious time actually and, and a great model of success. I think the next challenge will be for the cancer networks to, uh, to, to meet the other disease areas who will now look for a similar treatment, and particularly, and I spoke to Averill about this last week, is the cardiovascular health area, which it is a very much a, a similar incidence, and uh, yet nothing like the attention that cancer has received. So we're coming to the end of the mandate. Um, what that new parliament will look like, what that new commission will look like, all of that will be very contested after the European elections and before the formation of the commission. The president of the commission will be appointed. He or she will send out letters to the various commissioners, giving them guidelines. So there's a critical opportunity and moment there uh, for advocacy and to try to make sure that we continue the momentum of what has been achieved. Some of the ideas that are around are like Critical Medicines Act, an EU legislative uh, instrument around critical medicines, possibly uh, procurement fund for medicines across the European Union. So very uh, exciting pro uh, prospects, uh, but very much part of, of the next mandate. So back to you, Eileen. Thank you. Thank you, Barry Andrews. <clears throat>
And our final guest today is Dr. Thorsten Giesecke, who is General Manager, Commercial Business of Janssen Sciences in Ireland, and they are supporting today's event. Uh, Janssen comprises the pharmaceutical companies of Johnson & Johnson and appointed Dr. Giesecke as General Manager, Commercial Business, Janssen Sciences Ireland, which is responsible for commercialising six areas of medicines where the need is high, including oncology. He joined Janssen in Ireland in 2021 from the company's headquarters in New Jersey, where he worked as Director of Global Commercial Strategy for Early Assets in Oncology. Um, in several roles, he has spearheaded several strategic projects, including ensuring a transformational pipeline in prostate cancer. He first joined Janssen Germany in 2006 as medical development manager and assumed roles of increasing responsibility before being appointed business unit director for therapy, including neuroscience and metabolics. Dr. Thorsten Gieske. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks for not using the abbreviations, but I sometimes wonder if people actually, you know, know what, what, what's going on within the pharmaceutical company in any way. So thank you very much for the, uh, for the uh, very nice welcome and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a, a pleasure to be here um, this afternoon in this, uh, on this panel of very passionate people um, around the topic of oncology. Um, I believe I'm also um, wearing two hats today. The one is, you know, being an employee of a pharmaceutical company who is very much focused on oncology. The other one is being um, a German working in Ireland um, and uh, having experienced myself um, that, you know, this is uh, one of the nicest, if not the nicest place in the world due to the fantastic people here. You know, so um, experience um, this form of, uh, of inequality that um, people who work for my company and make the drugs here in the south of Ireland in Ringeskiddy in Cork um, do not have access to a treatment. And then when I go home to Germany, my neighbors there, of course, have access to the same treatment. Um, that, that's a form of in inequality, you know, when you experience that, where you wonder, um, does that actually um, have to be? So, so as a pharmaceutical company, we develop drugs globally, um, we get them approved regionally, but then in the end, it's the national governments actually who, um, have, uh, who are in the driver's seats uh, to decide, um, do we want this drug? Um, are we willing to reimburse this drug? And um, where we have you know, the, the, the national organizations um, uh, to, uh, to uh, generate the access for the local patients um, to these drugs. Um, COVID, I would fully agree, uh, seems to have increased the willingness of national governments. Um, the learning within COVID, the collaboration actually can accelerate by far um, the solution of medical problems. Um, is something that uh, makes national governments to share and pool more of their uh, competence or at, at least increase the billingness. Um, on the other hand, it's, it's um, astounding to see how the EU has gone into overdrive um, with um, the EU farm legislation, um, the EU health data space, um, the EU cancer mission, the beating cancer plan, uh, so much legislation currently um, uh, being developed and being discussed. And I think it's actually a great shaping process that's going on there. Um, and all of these um, feed into the European Health Union. So we were wondering as well, so what is the European Health Union? And I would say first and foremost, it's a vision. Um, it is, you know, how can we generate equitable access, affordability and availability of uh, um, of drugs, for example, across Europe, so that every European citizen has the same access to the same treatments. That uh, sounds very desirable, and that is what is being laid out in the EU farm legislation. Um, it is, however, important not to stop there, is what we believe, because you don't just want to manage the current status quo. Um, in order to beat cancer, um, we need innovation. In order to beat cancer, we need to we need progress. And um, that progress we feel, that is more something where the beating cancer strategy actually comes in, in order to beat cancer, you know, with the 10 flagship initiatives to say, how can we generate, um, how can we generate this progress? And this is why we are excited um, about these kind of European initiatives, where actually um, progress is on the forefront, innovations on the forefront. And um, 
where it's it's actually really really achievable. What what Ray mentioned earlier, um, that in in an aging population where we see where we will see an increasing incidence of cancer, we can still bring down um, mortality rates. And um, Ireland is actually you know well set up to benefit from from initiatives like this. So. We heard the the, uh, the numbers um, earlier that Ireland has a pretty high incidence of cancer um, and slightly below average mortality of cancer. However, um, what Ireland can claim is that the improvement in mortality in the recent, I want to say, decade has been faster than in many other countries. And when you look in detail at these mortality rates and see what cancers actually have improved, um, then it is multiple myeloma, it's prostate cancer, it's non-Hodgkin lymphoma, um, and these are all uh, cancer types where innovative medicines have become available. So I think without you know, having a clear causality, it's probably safe to say that innovative um, medical treatments contribute to um, the success that we're seeing in, um, in, in bringing down the mortality rate um, in, um, in, in Ireland. Um, there's also great clinical expertise and knowledge in this country, and um, I'd also like to point out the compassion for patients that um, senior Irish physicians like Ray, for example, demonstrate, you know, when you follow the press and, and when you see how they fight actually for access for their patients um, to, to innovative treatments. So... Ireland, as a small country, can certainly benefit from uh, from European um, health initiatives. And I would like, you know, I'd also um, looked at it and said, okay, what, where does it probably, where do we see the biggest impact? And it's interesting that there's a very high overlap. Data has been mentioned a number of times. So in a small country, very often, probably you can say in a small country, you have less big data and you need big data um, to drive innovation. Um, so pooling the data with uh, data from other countries, um, if, especially if you have rare diseases, pooling the data across a whole continent like Europe can actually drive innovation. In order to be able to pool data, the data needs to be interoperable. And therefore, it's important that if the EU agrees on a standard of data capturing, that Ireland um, follows this standard to make the data interoperable. Um, that, in, in, in our opinion, would be um, a great way. And I think um, the, um, um, the health information bill is, is on the table and is being discussed and is something that actually is a foundation for electronic health records that could you know, uh, open up the uh, um, feed into the exchange of electronic health records that the EU health data space offers. Um, and um, so you know, maybe accelerating that bill and um, making sure that standards are being are being kept is something where Ireland can really could really benefit. Um, another thing um, I believe has been mentioned before is precision medicine. So I think in in uh, in, in the you know expert circles is undisputed that precision medicine is the future of cancer care. Um, precision medicine um, um, uh, requires biomarker testing. So having a, a strategy for precision medicine that actually makes sure that uh, once a, a treatment enters the market, um, the biomarker testing is available, um, that would be very beneficial. On the other hand, we know that physicians usually don't employ the testing if there's no treatment available, because why would you do the testing? You know, so then on the other hand to say, you know, how can we combine both and how can we make sure that both um, is, is uh, uh, in a speedy way accessible for patients in Ireland? Um, that is what, what needs to be uh, contained in a, uh, in a precision medic medicine strategy. And then lastly, the point of inequity. Yes, this registry um, about inequity is, is certainly going to, to benchmark within societies. Um, but it's also going to access, uh, it's also going to benchmark across societies. So, um, and the questions, we we do already have benchmarks and we know Ireland doesn't necessarily perform well benchmarked against um, other countries. And, you know, me coming from, from Germany, for example, 39% of existing cancer drugs are available in Ireland, whereas 98% of cancer drugs are available in Germany. Um, if a new drug is being made available, it takes um, almost 700 days in Ireland, so almost two years 
before that drug is available while um, patients in Germany are already being treated with this drug. So that's where um, we would say, you know, if maybe this, this registry of inequity is able to create the momentum to say, look, improvement of this process is necessary, uh, budget is necessary, uh, it's not going to come for free. Um, um, but this is how I think um, really Ireland can make enormous strides towards ideally beating cancer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I'm just going to see, are there any questions in the audience? I have a couple of here on the screen for me, but if there are any in the audience, we'll take them first. No, so there's one here uh, from Claire Noonan, who's Operations and Accreditation Lead in Beaumont RCSI Cancer Centre, talking about cancer data, which you've all referenced. Uh, patients in Ireland go between multiple hospitals on their diagnostic and treatment journey. How can private and public hospitals be supported to work together for the purposes of sharing that data? <laughs> Who'd like to take it? Ray, I suppose. System first. I mean, I think we have to agree on a system and implement it. We were near, we were nearly there. I thought a few years ago, and then the momentum seemed to fail. I mean, in uh, radiology, um, we have an almost national system. Not quite. It's almost there. In laboratory medicine, we have a number of hospitals that use the same system, but we don't have a dedicated in prescribing. For oncology, we have, uh, we will soon have a national system, and um, so that you'll be able to view whatever drugs you get, no matter from where you're you're getting them. So that they are improvements, but we need an overriding um, system whereby you know they talk about you where you have your history on a stick, where the patient can bring it around with them and you know plug it in. Here we go. This is what's happened to me, but we're we're very far away from that. I'm afraid. OK, so here's one then about GDPR. Uh, Angela Clayton Lee is COO Cancer Trials Ireland. Could the panel please speak to the challenges around developing regulatory harmony between EU and non-EU countries? Anyone want to take that? <laughs> yes. I'd be delighted to take that on. Um, so, I mean, the, the GDPR, I mean, I, I really... I, I'm, way out of my lane here but obviously gdpr has a has a reach well beyond the european union um this is the classic brussels effect where regulations in the european union um uh, cast their net well well beyond the member states um so no i i really am not sure how it can apply yeah. <laughs> into this area eileen so i'm going to take a pass on um, we've had great difficulty because Ireland takes a very, let's say, a very tough interpretation of the same regulations where other European countries don't. And as a result, it makes it extremely difficult for us to open clinical trials. And you get different interpretations in different hospitals in the same state as well. So that that I, I wonder, is there any way that that can be uh, improved? That... Well, I mean, I, I, I understood that the the challenge in clinical trials is the scale here in Ireland. And we just, uh, you know, don't have the, the patient numbers, in a, particularly in sort of rare diseases, obviously, and the clinical trials aren't. So the cross-border, multi-center clinical trials is much more attractive. And we hope that the beating cancer strategy will uh, incentivize that, encourage that. Um, as to the strictness of the interpretation of GDPR, um, I, I haven't come across this issue, but obviously very interested to see what we can do to explore it. Did you want to add something, Eva? Maybe just to say that, you know, from a, from a patient point of view, I think the GDPR is a very positive development in terms of protecting health data. I'm really sensitive of health data. People are, you know, and I think that's part of the equation as well. On digital health, there are enormous improvements. Uh, there are like there are enormous innovations that would be enabled by more data collection, more data sharing, more use of wearables or digital technologies. But they're understandable, patient, they're understandable concerns from a privacy point of view and from patients' point of view about well, who has access to that, why, what might they use it for. Um, so I think data protection is, is really important. It's a huge part of digital innovation, making sure that you have adequate data protection. Um, 
nurse cancer side, I guess we've, we've had to do a lot of work when GDPR came in to make sure that all of our own services were GDPR compliant, our, um, our nursing services, our research, our fundraising, all of that. So we did a huge work, a lot of men to work on it internally. And what I will say that I definitely think that there could have been more help um, in terms of understanding how to apply that. I think you had a lot of organizations and we won the biggest charities and we were helping other charities do it. We had a lot of organizations figuring it out for ourselves how to do that. Um, and certainly it was feedback that we got from the research community that uh, Ray mentioned that, look, individual hospitals were having to figure that out locally. Um, and that both the, we did, I think it would be, certainly be a strong feeling within the research community. Um, and the healthcare community in general, that Ireland did take a very conservative approach to the interpretation of it, certainly much more conservative, much stricter approach than other member states. Um, and that as a result, people are, and that, you know, there are significant fines, which is great when you don't want Facebook stealing your data or you don't want, you know, and you want to make sure that your neighbours, you know, in a hospital can't log on and see why you were in there, that you were getting chemotherapy or things like, like that's great. But then it also does have a chilling effect in terms of hospitals were afraid then to approve trials until they figured out how they could do it in a GDPR compliant way. And they're all figuring that out individually. Um, and that took a long time. And it did. It de definitely meant that trial activity was really stymied for a long time and that it, like some hospitals got there faster than others. So I think the lesson is really just, I think, from a European perspective, I think, is to have more guidelines for when these regulations are coming in maybe, to, you know, to work by the European level and Irish level to make sure that, you know, with there being the directives that regulations are being transported, like uh, transported in Ireland in a way that, you know, meets the spirit, but doesn't have, not, you know, unintended consequences, particularly in healthcare, where we need to have innovation. Um, and also that there's guidance for organisations, whether that's NGOs, pharma companies, hospitals, research institutions, on how to comply. But that that is kind of spelled out for you what you should do rather than people having to figure it out for themselves. Thank you very much. Now, I know a lot of disappointment in healthcare circles about this year's budget and the lack of extra funding for health, whether it be for research, for new drugs, for whatever. So here's a specific one from John Glynn for Averill and for Senator Hoey. Are there any alternative plans since the lack of investment from the Irish government for Budget 24 towards the cancer strategy? And can the EU help put more pressure on investment for Ireland? So I would say that, look, I mean, the Irish Cancer Society, one of our key roles is advocacy and putting pressure on government to deliver. And as I said, we're really disappointed that this national cancer strategy hasn't been funded. There were incredible strides made under our first two cancer strategies in coming from, as Sarsa mentioned, being behind in EU terms to really making leaps and catching up and getting to um, the average. Um, but our current one was published in 2017 and the ambition was to get to best in class. It talks about getting to world class performance, not just average, but world class outcomes in prevention, detection, treatment. And it hasn't been funded. Um, and we just think that's crazy because you can see in cancer, like the investment leads to improvements and outcomes, it leads to savings. If cancer is, de is detected earlier, it's so much easier to treat, like your in cancer, say for example, testicular cancer, diagnosed at stage one, 90% survival, stage four, you're under 20%, 20 it's the same for other cancers. And that means, you know, worse outcomes, both for the individual, but also far more expensive treatments. And it puts people in the space where the only thing that might work for them is a really expensive new treatment that will work um, towards the end. Whereas picking, investing in area detection and prevention area detection would have meant that they maybe never would have had the cancer. Or it would have been picked up much earlier. So for Cancer Society's point of view, it's enormously frustrating. Um, part of our role is we are primarily publicly funded. We raise the vast majority of our funding from the state and we only get five from the public, we're going to get 5% from the state. And we use that funding to be the largest voluntary funder of cancer research in Ireland. So funding research, funding sometimes basic infrastructure that will be funded by the sta state elsewhere. But we fund, for example, Cancer Trials Ireland, a um, million to Cancer Trials Ireland and service innovations in hospitals. So we try to help, as Jana said, like you try to not make lack of government uh, priority and investment mean that you can't do anything. We try to inspire the public and see what we can do ourselves. Um, and ahead of, you know, there'll be an election coming up in mm -hmm. sometime before March 2025, we'll be working hard to make cancer a priority for all parties. Um, because, as I said, look, we're all going to be affected, unfortunately. 
And it's an absolute no brainer that the state invests now. Like that prediction that Ray mentioned that we number of rate of our number of people getting cancer in Ireland will double over the next 25 years. That's a prediction. It doesn't have to become a reality. And if we actually invest in the right stages of the cancer journey now, the earlier ones, we can save on that. Um, and I know John Glenn is from the Gavin Glenn Foundation is doing amazing work um, with children and families affected by childhood cancer. Um, and again, I just feel that some of the work that John does, some of the work that we do and others across the NGO sector shouldn't have to be done by ourselves. It should be a good government priority. It should be resourced. And we should all know that whenever we do uh, face cancer, our loved one or a loved one does, that they're getting what we would get in Germany or what we would get elsewhere. Uh, Kay Duggan Walls from DG Research and Innovation wanted to highlight the EU cancer mission, which is going hand in hand with the Beating Cancer Plan. And this obviously is funding research to the tune of 365 million in the last couple of years. Annie, your response to the previous question. I mean, Avril kind of said it all. And I'm, I'm, I'm not in a government party, so I, I can't be held accountable for uh, some of this. And I think um, based on some of the conversations we would have had at the Health Committee when we had people in from National Cancer Strategy and stuff, it, it is surprising. I don't know if, if there was like free warning it wasn't, but like it, it is surprising that the funding isn't where it needs to be um, because it was very clear, even from a Health Commission perspective member, when they came in, they were outlining the real potential of this strategy, the real potential for where we could go with cancer care in Ireland if we kept going and had the, the funding. And you know, when you say that you know 5% comes from the government for the Irish Cancer Society and that you're funding research, to me, that is not where we need to be in terms of like, the, the, it is not right that we have to fundraise members of the community who have largely been affected by cancer shouldn't be the ones that are fundraising to do the research on cancer. You know, that, that this to me is a no brainer in terms of long-term investment, long-term care. Um, I am absolutely convinced that investing in cancer care as with other areas, but investing in those early stages of detection and um, those trials, you know, the, the long-term savings and it's, it even feels a little bit, you know, it feels really icky to talk about cancer care in terms of savings and money and financial, because these are my dad, my aunt, my grandmother. I, the one and two, it seems optimistic to me. I seem to have terrible genes in my family. We've been really terribly affected by it. And when we talk about savings, sometimes I find it very difficult to do that. You know, I'm, I'm talking about this hypo hypothetical people and I see my family members kind of their faces going in front of me because these are actual people we're talking about who and their lives have meaning regardless of what stage in their life they get that diagnosis their lives have meaning and they should be able to get 98 percent of the drugs and they should be able to not have to go to another country and it shouldn't be up to the irish cancer society to be funding research uh, that that should be government led you know so i don't know where the alternative funding for that comes from because i don't i maybe i might be at odds with pharmaceutical companies but i don't think there should it should be coming from government level it shouldn't be up to academics scrumming it out with horizon funding trying to find things like this should be something that is meaningfully funded um at a, both a, a government level and obviously at a european level and it, it really bothers me you know obviously we do all of our things that we do but it, it bothers me that we have to rely on people who've been affected by cancer to fundraise for their own research so that someone else doesn't have to suffer that isn't where the way i think we should be doing cancer care Anyone else want to come in on that, Barry? Just very briefly, just to um, the cancer medicines have become very expensive. And um, just some of the figures that total expenditure from 2008 on cancer medicines to 2018 increased from 14 billion to 32 billion over a course of 10 years. Per head of population in the European Union has increased from 28 euro per person to 61 euro in the same period. And that cancer medicines as a percentage of the total of cancer costs increased from 17% to 31%. So it's a, uh, so, so the EU pharmaceutical strategy is trying to some extent to try and address this, to try and use the scale to, of the European Union to create a single market for medicines, mm -hmm. essentially. Uh, and that can only, as we saw with the pandemic, can only benefit smaller member states. Um, so... I, I'm not pro, I'm not contesting the deficits, the historical deficits in the HSE, um, but I do feel uh, uh, some level of optimism that the European pharmaceutical strategy can help. Some of the pharmaceuticals industry is not happy 
with some of the elements of the um, of what has been proposed, more transparency around the costs of R and D in pharmaceutical industry in the pharmaceutical industry is required under the legislation. So we hope that, as Annie mentioned earlier, this will filter into the Europe, the Irish system in due course. Awesome. Yeah, and, and I think, as I said, I think we're having uh, excellent discussions around this, how, how to move forward. Just um, just when, in terms of cost of drugs, um, if the focus is just on oncology, um, these are the, the appropriate numbers. Um, in terms of drugs overall, the, the, the share of drug costs and of healthcare costs has not increased. Why is that? Because before uh, we made these huge strides in oncology, actually lipid lowering drugs were you know, the last big thing which uh, extended overall survival and increased the health of people. All those drugs have come off patent um, and have released a huge amount of money that is now actually being spent into oncology drugs. So overall, you know, the, the cost for drug um, in, in all indications across now, I think we're, we're looking at this over three decades now, has remained um, um, amazingly stable. Yeah, so so oncology at the moment is is in a in a period where there's huge uh, progress and where there's huge innovation and um, it was said in the beginning of the um, of the discussion it feels like we're close to getting more cures to more cancers so that's probably why an investment at this time in this um, therapeutic area is justified. Did you want a final word there? Yeah, just, I just wanted to say briefly on the, you know, on, on the cost of medicines. It is, it's amazing the innovation that's coming through. It is crazy that Ireland, like that Portugal is the only country with a slower system than ours and that Irish patients aren't getting access to those medicines. But I think it, I think the EU, I agree with Barry that like there, there's absolutely a role for the EU because we also like there's very, it's very difficult to get that. And we work as part of the European Fair Pricing Network, European Cancer League with cancer societies from across the, across the EU. And it's really difficult to get transparent data on prices and what governments are actually paying. But it is generally understood that the German government, as a result of the size of the market, um, is paying less than certainly the starting prices. And then there's the negotiation from the starting price with firm and then what it agrees with government as it goes through an insanely slow process here to actually get something approved. But there has to be something in the EU coming together as a market um, to try and come up with a fair system. And look, that needs to take account of the, you know, the income levels in different countries. The, you know, that could see some countries paying, you know, if, if it, there's not some kind of weighting, it seems the lower income countries, potentially some of them paying more than they are now. Like there's all kinds of challenges with that. But not doing it, I just think it, it's very difficult for small countries like Ireland to figure that out on our own. So I think we hope that between EU level, you know, pharma companies needing a solution, our own nat national systems, that we can find a way to bring that together and come up with a system that, you know, funds research and, and development and um, incentivize companies to develop, to drive that innovation, but also res results in fair pricing. Um, across the EU and fair access. Um, I do think the EU is central to that. Okay, and then picking up on that, um, Jim McGrath, the IPHA, wants to ask Ray McDermott and maybe Thorsten also, what do you believe are the patient and health implications of not funding the most recent innovations? Well, we certainly won't get to wherever I want us to be. So, uh, yeah, because uh, as Thorsten said, I think the, the way things work is new drugs are developed. OK, we should focus on prevention, of course, and early detection without a doubt. But the reality is many cancers like pancreas cancer, which I see very commonly, is typically diagnosed very late. We don't have any good treatments for it, apart from ones that we've been using for many years. There's a lot of interest in developing new agents for that. And that will hopefully come. I think it'll come very soon. And then how do we how do we cure more patients with pancreatic cancer then? Well, by using these drugs earlier in the disease process, that's going to inevitably cost more money. And without that, we are going to languish. We're, we're doing reasonably well in pancreas cancer at the moment. Uh, it's still poor, as, as Abel said, it, 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 uh, only 20 percent roughly of patients will will survive that disease. So we want to get that figure up. And the way to do that is by investing in these new treatments and bringing them earlier in the disease process. If we don't do that, well, then we're going to go down in terms of our outcomes. 
Yeah, I think to Jim's question, I think um, inevitably there was agreement in, in the press that having no budget for innovative medicines will further increase waiting times for Irish patients. And there was an earlier question about our mortality rate. And is it because we detect cancers later or is it due to other factors, say, like too much smoking and too much drinking? And uh, I think COVID definitely had an impact in terms of detect detecting cancers uh, later. And I think, um, you know, I think traditionally in Ireland, there was probably a reluctance to go and see the doctor, you know, back in when I think of back when I started to do oncology, I don't think that's the case anymore. I think that is uh, nowadays those typically men are dragged along by their wives or partners and, and you know, their force to come in. So actually, I don't think that's as big as a problem as it used to be in Ireland. Um, I definitely think we can always do better, but I think we have managed to get over that one. I think some of it is that, you know, we, we started, so for example, when you're looking at the best performing countries, which is the, the Nordic countries in particular, they started screening earlier than yeah. us. So while we now have the three screening programs, um, they started those earlier than us, so they're seeing results faster. And I think that just generally makes that point about early adoption. Um, and then the other another key one is, look, it's the inequalities piece that's, that's mentioned, like there are huge differences between cancers um, and... As, um, also, I'm, I'm between communities and he mentioned, you know, you've one in four cancers being picked up in ED departments, typically amongst lower. Mm -hmm. Some of them is pancreas, some of them is cancers that were almost impossible to detect until mm -hmm. people were in pain. But a lot of it actually um, is cancers where people may have had indications they had symptoms, but they didn't have the money to go to see the GP or, or they couldn't get access. They couldn't, you know, they're waiting on a waiting list for cancer diagnostic test, or that somebody with private health insurance can jump that list, or if you can pay for it privately, you can jump that list. So we would always say the biggest issue in Ireland is detection. It's cancer detection. Um, because if we could, you know, there's definitely issues around access to innovative medicines and all of that. But the biggest difference you can make in survival would be that if you picked up every, like cancer, where we can, if you could pick up cancer earlier when it's easier to treat. Um, and things like lung screening, hopefully, which are coming down the line that Annie mentioned, where you can take it won't be for the whole population, but it will be for people from particularly lower socioeconomic groups who have a long term history of heavy smoking. And you bring those people in um, and scan them and hopefully pick up signs, because we know, unfortunately, in that community that, for example, like they you know, have poor health, health outcomes, poor health access. They will ignore things like a long term cough because they feel it's just typical of being a smoker um so i think the more that you can put screening and things like that in place that will make a big difference final comments i think if i you know when we're talking about when i'm reflecting when my, when my grand my grandmother my granny about 10 years ago you know by the time she had died when she had gotten her first appointment letter she had already, you know, she was uh, diagnosed in November. There just happened to be you know, some sort of VHI, something or the other, or that her son, you know, some sort of, anyway, somehow we got her into the hospital. And by the time she had gotten the letter to say that she could, should come in for her first screening for her illness, she had already been dead a month. And that was over 10 years ago. I don't know when our waiting lists were, you know, at a different point to what they're at. So that, that again, that just, that real inequality piece between and, and I really, you know, the people who have the insurance, people who don't have the insurance, the people and then the people who have the ability or a fighting family member or themselves have the ability to fight to get into a system versus those who don't. Um, and I think that inequality piece and that obviously ties into what drugs people have access to. But I'm, I'm really struck the further along I've been involved in this political life and this activist life, who has access to that social capital and who has access to that community-based support where someone goes actually that cough is not normal as opposed to you know and and, and lots of people don't even have cough my, my dad didn't have a single cough mm -hmm. you know yeah. it, no idea yeah, yeah. um you know and so that, that 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 social piece of inequalities is something that i really think we need to get to grips with while we're dealing with uh, access to medicines and access to drugs and access to all of these other things and um, cancer care can't be who can be negotiated into a hospital first um, and then family members get letters when they're dead for their first appointment. That is a terrible state. You know, that's not where we need to be. So we need to be able to lift people up into that advocacy piece for themselves as well uh, while we're building the system we need. Okay.
a somber note to end on, but we're right at the time. <laughs> so I'd like to thank you five for being here today and for your contributions. Barry Andrews, Dr. Thorsten Giesecke, Senator Annie Hoey, Professor Ray McDermott and Avril Parr. Thank you all. And thanks to you here in the room and to you watching us online. Thank you all for participating today. And until the next time, Sloan. Thank you.